Awesome. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you might be from. Pete Pardo here from Sea of Tranquility. Welcome to another episode of Friday Morning at the Fun House. I almost said Monday morning. I, I don't even know what day it is anymore. But uh, uh, of course, we're here, as always, every Friday with Martin Popoff. Good morning, my friend. How's uh, things by you this morning? Yes, morning, morning. Things are okay. The uh, the very cold weather is back here in Toronto. We're down to kind of kind of zero Fahrenheit-ish, uh, you know, uh, minus 12, minus 11. Up yeah, here, but a uh, nice sunny day. But uh, yeah, I've got, got to run some errands. Tons of snow all over the ground. It's been snowing a lot. Yeah. Not a lot of places to park around the city, but uh, yeah. Yeah, I can imagine. Here. We're getting that tonight into tomorrow, from what I understand. It's been brutally cold here. I mean, I think we it was 28 the other day, which was felt like uh, we were like experiencing August in January, but because uh, it's been brutal cold today, it's I think it's going to be about 30, but then tomorrow it's going to dip back down into the teens again. So it's just, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, this is, this is winter is here this year. This is oh, not sure. like last year or the year before where it was like, you know, 40 yeah. degrees in January. This is, uh, this is the real deal. So uh, before we get started on today's topic, uh, Martin got some interesting feedback. Well, we both did actually some interesting feedback on last week's episode that we wanted to kind of touch on. So Martin, uh, what do you got? Yeah, this is kind of interesting. This is actually technically feedback uh, by coincidence on my History and Five Songs with Martin Popoff audio podcast. I, I did an episode on early Mutt Lang and I used City Boy as, a, as an example twice. But yeah, in the last episode, we talked at length and I just told Steve, uh, this is from Steve Broughton from, from City Boy. I just, uh, I just sent him the link to, uh, to our, our video talk about bands we like only one album by thing right and uh so he's gonna look at that as well but uh but yeah so he says um it's kind of interesting because it gives a little insight into city boy he says uh this is steve broughton lunt here from city boy very enjoyable podcast thanks for the city boy shout outs great research and accurate observations for what it's worth here are mutt insights it's a long, it's longer than i anticipated so please feel free to read ignore simply delete fully understand mutt lang and in particular his dynamics with city boy you have to go back to his roots in south africa mutt was a studio rat used to hang out around emi studios and got noticed by clive calder who was a and r for them at the time clive recognized Mutt's talents and before too long put him to work with his wife to be Stevie. Um, uh, records that were successful in the US and UK usually have a delayed release in South Africa. So Clive identified. He goes on, let's see, let's uh, concentrate out on singles. Clive went on to be Mutt's manager, City Boys manager, and eventually the founder owner of Jive Records. Eventually they came to the UK together. Um, then there's us. We never once sat down as a band and discussed and decided upon a specific direction. There was no band concept or manifesto for what we wanted to be. This, of course, is. Um, city boy to remind people the songs just poured out of the writers and then the arrangements just evolved from there everything about us was far more organic than our albums would imply for instance mike slamer joined us on guitar not because we were looking for a specific sound but because he worked with chris dunn in a music store we wanted an electric guitarist but never auditioned for one mike came to a rehearsal and initially initially joined us on bass and then pretty soon switched roles with chris and took over all major electric guitar duties from that moment on our original polite sound grew some angry testicles we totally lucked out no master plan involved like most bands each member had a different taste in music and wrote arranged accordingly we also just pieced our arrangements together as soon as they were written no questions asked or philosophical discussions had in retrospect it was a laughably haphazard process then mutt joined the party mutt like us had very varied taste tastes but he was extremely radio single-minded due to a south africa studio schooling where dissecting hit records were his curriculum his he helped 100 percent help us craft our rather complex songs into something far more musically mature so we know that uh, uh, from mutt later uh, that we could have ever done by ourselves an ar and our man uh he was not, though. He was a musician better than all of us, bar Mike. He was young, relatively inexperienced in the world outside South Africa, and like us, was just swimming in the waters of infinite studio possibilities with total abandon. Our disparate stylistic menu of songs let him play and tinker at will. So play he did, and so we did. As an a &R man myself at Jive and Atlantic in later life, I'm astonished at how little advice we ever received from any adult. Uh, this trend continued right up to and including the day the earth caught fire. I have no idea what it was like after that, as I was not involved in the last two albums. In closing, as you are a self 
confessed metalhead, you can most probably bin 50% of our recorded work as it'll be too gentle for you. No wonder you chose machines <laughs> you know, as, as a favorite song. So I thought that was pretty cool. So he'll, he'll probably look at our, our video uh, situation as well. But, and also I just wanted to mention, I, I love reading the comments. That's one of my favorite things. I think we, we get, you know, I love the viewers are so smart. Right. But um I just wanted to push back again because I did. I wrote a comment saying, look, this whole thing with the Beatles is just that I worship that album to death. It's not like it's the only album I like by the Beatles. I love the Beatles. And I love everything they've done. It's just that I worship that album so much. And that that was my my weird take on that. So I, I wrote a little bit about that. Uh, but then, of course, you know, the way comments work, people don't see that. And they write later, oh, I can't believe that's the only album you like by the Beatles and all this. So just wanted to defend myself a little more there. About yeah, I mean, it, the concept of last week was about, you know, specific bands where there's one album we really like a lot and maybe we're indifferent to the rest or maybe we haven't heard much of the rest or, you know, in some situations, maybe we just don't like the rest. But I mean, I think you were pretty explicit saying, you know, what? I, I dig the Beatles. Yeah, I like a bunch of these other albums, but there's really only one that you truly, really, really love. Right. Yeah. 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 Yep. So that brings us to today's topic. Now that we got all that out of the way, um, another interesting uh, topic idea here today, um, Martin and I were talking about double albums, and uh, we came up with this concept of the double album hangover. So these bands that had this very notable double album, whether it was good, bad, or ugly, and then how do you follow that up? So, you know, in some of these instances we're going to talk about today, it, it's a double album that was received very positively, that the band really liked a lot. And how do you follow that? And you go back to a single or a double album that maybe wasn't received so, so positively. And how do you kind of follow that up? Or maybe the double album prompted some dissension within the band. I think we're going to kind of cover all sorts of fronts today and talk about that album after the big one, after the big double album and what they did afterwards. So I'll have, uh, we each got five of them. We'll have a couple honorable mentions at the end, and I'll have Martin kick us off with his first selection of the day. Okay, so my first selection is uh, is Metallica, and here is their their double album and Justice for All, um, and they followed it up with the Black album. There's not much to show there, but I thought I'd show these uh, really cool little CD making of things that uh, a buddy of mine, one of my early publishers, Rob Godwin, over at Collector's Guide Publishing, he made a bunch of these little. Uh, little uh, CD side book size booklets on the making of albums and put them in here. So we're talking about the Metallica album, but the funny thing here is that, um, you know, the double album is, uh, is kind of the last record Metallica would make in the vinyl age. And it's a double album to be sure, but it is 65 minutes and 25 seconds long. So it's only, it's, it's a short double album. Yeah. And then Metallica <laughs> is their first album of the CD age. And it's a single album. And it is 62 minutes, 31 seconds long. So it's literally uh, less than three minutes shorter than the double album. Um, but, you know, in, in my mind uh, and in people who were, were like buying vinyl up to the last minute, I always, I always look at 1990 as the chop off, chop off point. I remember walking into Sam the Record Man in downtown uh, Toronto. And, uh, and I remember the last pieces of vinyl I was able to buy easily enough were Aerosmith Pump and Red Hot Chili Peppers, Mother's Milk. I think there were 89 albums. So, so this, is, this is a clear single album from Metallica. And of course, it, it reminds me a little bit of the Rush Hemisphere story that you talked about a little bit, I, I think it, uh, last episode, right? Uh, this idea of, um, of just like, we've taken this as far as we can go. So with, and Justice for All, it just got proggier and proggier and the songs got longer and more complicated and it had that really eccentric production to it. So it was a real inside baseball sort of, um, you know, intellectual thrash record, even more intellectual than Ride going up through Master uh, to, to Unjustice. Um, so they'd taken that as far as they could and it was time for them to do their, uh, what I love about this is that uh, the same way, the same corollary there is, is the idea of, uh, of cover songs. You know, Iron Maiden thought about cover songs like a fan, like we would. So did Metallica. And so here they are thinking like a fan. You know, we, we wish Iron Maiden would do this and, and turn in the, the album with 13, four and a half minute songs next time, right? Uh, but Metallica actually did do that. They thought like a fan and said, what would our fans like? What do us, what do us as fans like, you know? 
we want to groove more. We want it to be heavier and have more bottom end. We want the shorter songs. Lars was listening to a lot of ACDC at the time. And he said, we just want to rock out. We want it. We want to go back to that, that magic of for whom the bell tolls kind of thing. Right. Um, where you're just where you're just sort of impressed by the immense riffs. It's simpler. It's just more head banging. And that's what they did with the Metallica album. And people loved it in droves, obviously produced by Bob Rock. It was probably it, I would say it was the heaviest sounding Metallica album so far in terms of the production. And it was actually slower and doomier. So by some definitions, you know, if heavy means hard to move like a, like you're lifting a big piano or something this was the lifting the big piano album of theirs uh versus you know you know was ride or master or or um or just as heavier well in in certain ways it was more heavy metal and and this was getting a little a little more mainstream or commercial but only because it was um slower and catchier and all the songs instead of on justice where the songs average out a little over six minutes here they're probably averaging out at, at around five minutes uh you know they still write kind of long but it was just a super catchy album so the hangover is more that they they took it as far as they can get they took it as far as they can get technically just like rush on hemispheres but they also took it far and made a double album so, so they were like, they, they, they knew they were in need of, of some editing and pulling it back. And then famously, uh, it just blew up like crazy because it was just so accessible. It was people's gateway into heavy metal, just like Quiet Riot in the old, old days or even Motorhead to a certain extent or how Ramones is a gateway to punk. This was like a pretty darn heavy album. And yet it sold like 16, you know, it's 16 times platinum. How, what do we got here? Yeah, 16 times platinum. And Justice was eight times platinum. Justice says five, five million copies in the States. But there's that whole double album yeah, counting twice bowl that, you, that nobody can quite figure out exactly. But yeah, so, so Metallica's hangover was, was almost like a self-imposed, we want to try something different. And, uh, and it just worked out, obviously, amazingly. You could also say that the Black Album is for those fans who kind of like metal, but they don't like thrash. Because I, I yeah. would struggle to say that the Black Album is a thrash metal album. And oh, it's yeah, almost so like, and just as for all, was Metallica themselves saying, okay, this is where we started, but I think yeah. we're done with this now. We need to move into other, other areas. It's, it's almost like a, a mix between a, um, you know, a very purist Black Sabbath album, like a volume four and Candle Mass and Witchfinder General, oddly enough, right? Yeah. And, and, and the catchiest things from, from Ride or from Master, like I yeah. say, a For Whom the Bell Tolls or an Escape. And I remember when Enter Sandman came out as the advanced single, loved it to death. It's still my favorite song on it. And a lot of Metallica fans will, will either they're sick of it or they don't like the fact that it was the biggest hits. They say it's not a great song. I thought it was exactly what I would have wanted them wanted out of them as fans. And I could tell they were thinking as fans. Yeah. I mean, personally, I loved Enter Sandman when it came out. I couldn't get enough of that song. Here today in 2022, I, I probably never need to hear it again. But, you know, oh, yeah. back in the day, I loved it. Absolutely loved yeah. it. Yeah. I mean, you know, metal fans, especially fans who love the underground, I think kind of resent bands and albums that get too big. Right. You know, you have a band that you grew up there where they were they were cutting edge. They were underground. And all of a sudden they become big on a mainstream level. And all of a sudden they're not cool anymore. And all of a sudden, ah, I don't I don't like that album. I don't like the music. I mean, I, I think you're your kind of comparison or you when you mentioned acdc before and how lars was i mean that's to me the, the metallica album is them looking at a band like acdc and say hey we can still rock out but make it accessible for the masses right and ourselves you know maybe we want to do something different and here's where you really get lars's personality coming to the floor that the, those uh those interesting bass drum snare you know punctuations for for phil's kind of thing you really get to see the lars drumming style on this record right yeah exactly cool all right my first choice of the day is going to be um judas priest nostradamus the big double album 2008 and redeemer of souls 2014 six years later 
six years later. So we, you know, we all know the story leading up to Nostradamus. Of course, you know, Halford is out of the band for quite some time. He comes back out, back into Judas Priest for Angel of Retribution, which was a great comeback album for them. Everybody's excited to see the band back together. Uh, a few years later, they decide to put together this big grand epic project uh, called Nostradamus based on, you know, the, the Nostradamus storyline. And it's, it, it's this big, epic, symphonic metal concept album. And most folks were a little puzzled by this. And it was not a big seller. They have barely played any of this album live on the road. You know, I know they, they talked about playing the whole thing live at some point. I don't. I, I think at this point that's never going to happen, and maybe that's a good thing. Uh, but most fans, myself included, were really puzzled by this. And it's it's a long album. It's it's got all sorts of synthesizers and choirs and orchestras, and maybe it's a little proggy, right? If Judas Priest can be labeled as proggy, it's also the last album with the you know Halford, Tipton, Downing, Hill, and Travis lineup. You know the the kind of the painkiller lineup. And I have talked to so many people who proclaim this is like easily Judas Priest's worst album. I've talked to people who actually think this is the best thing they've ever done. And it's, it's a pretty good sounding album, but you know, I hadn't listened to this in, in a number of years and I listened to it last night and you know, I couldn't even get the whole way through it. Somewhere in this is maybe a 35 or 40 minute pretty decent metal album. As it stands as a whole, uh, I mean, to me personally, this is a major fail. I think the guys wanted to try to do something different. I get it. Give them credit for that, because I think any longstanding veteran band trying to do something a little bit different than the norm, you have to give them kudos for that. Uh, I just don't know if this was a place where they ever needed to go. And I think they were very disappointed that uh, the reaction to, to this was what it was. I mean, it didn't sell really well. Uh, you know, the fans were basically, you know, for the most part, they were kind of split on this. I think the critics were kind of split on this and they weren't all that compelled to really do much with this out on tour. Right. So in between. So then again, we're talking six years here between albums. So they go out, they actually do tour, but they don't do the whole Nostradamus thing. A couple of years later, KK decides I'm retiring from the band again. Is that based on issues and problems that had to do with this album and the way this came out. I don't know. You, you, you read all sorts of things, right? You know, Halford talks very highly of this album. KK, not so much. So whatever. So they come back in 2014. KK is no longer in the band. You got Richie Faulkner in the group now on the second guitar, Redeemer of Souls. And here, this is back to basic priest. I mean, this basically goes back, you know, it's as if this never happened. And this is the direct continuation of Angel of Retribution. Uh, typical heavy metal anthems, you got, uh, you know, all the, the big production values and the symphonic nature of the other album is pretty much gone here. You got power metal on here. You got a little bit of, a little bit of throwback to rock and roll with Crossfire. You got songs like Halls of Valhalla, Dragon Eye, Cold Blooded, March of the Dam. It's just Sword of Democles, Battle Cry. Typically what you would hear from Judas Priest. It's a good sounding album. Debuts at number six on the Billboard charts. Well received by the fans despite the fact that KK is not a part of it. So, you know, this basically, again, and we're going to see that in a couple of instances here, the big double album ends in an era. And the next follow-up after the double album hangover starts the new era. So this is the Richie Faulkner era. And this, you know, also the last, uh, you know, real album and tour with Glenn as a full-time member of the touring band because they would announce that Glenn's got uh, you know his illness uh, going forward after this but uh, yeah so there you have it Nostradamus and Redeemer of Souls complete about face back to basics priest end of an era that's that yeah one interesting thing I've always never been able to shake from my mind about about Redeemer is um, it 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 has this very eccentric guitar and drum sound that, that is kind of a weird processed electronic-y thing that definitely you hear on Nostradamus and you also hear on Glenn, Glenn Tipton. Very compressed. Of fire. Yeah, very compressed. Yeah, yeah, very odd sound. And so I, I thought that was the one thing that carries over, but yeah, they've decided that's that's it for all that nonsense. I I, I did a um, I did a, uh, a school paper on Nostradamus in high school. Uh, so I learned all about him and all the quatrains and all that stuff. And I don't, I don't know if I even believe the whole thing. So as soon as you don't know, if you believe the whole thing, I mean, do you really need a, a double album on it? If you're not a believer, right? Yeah. 
So I don't know. It's I, I literally, literally I listened to it yesterday and I, I couldn't get through the whole thing. I was like, there are, there are bits that I like. There's some tracks here and there that I like, but like in between each of the good songs, there's this schmaltzy, you know, kind of like atmospheric, boom, yeah. whatever. And I'm like, oh my God, this could have been totally trimmed down to like a nice 40 minutes and maybe it's not that bad, but as it is, oh man. But again, you talk to people who think that's the greatest thing they've ever done. Yeah. Nostradamus better than stained class or you know I mean held in for leather I, mean, I have a hard time with that but you know hey to each his yeah. own right well that's that's the other dimension of this episode that the being a sucker for a double album right because a double album is a big important you know thing and and yeah. and so so it's like you really feel like you have you have to try harder right to, to yeah. get into it and so if you if you get sucked into the whole story of nostradamus and you go down that rabbit hole like what what better thing than to have two records of it right yeah and i guess the, the grandiosity of it all is to many people kind of appealing it's it's like you know i mean look at music from the elder right i mean that that is that was kiss trying to do something this big grand spectacle and that really didn't work out for them either but i think you know year all these years later i mean i used to hate music from the elder now I listen to it and I'm like, hey, you know what? It's really not all that bad. There's plenty of good on there. So who knows, Martin? Maybe in 10 years now, we'll all be looking back at Nostradamus. Like, you know what? This really was a classic that we just yeah, didn't know at yeah. the time. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, my next choice, I, I called a slight audible on this, but I think I'm going to be safe here because we know Pete's not going to be talking about The Clash at all. So uh, um, here we go with The Clash. Um, so here's their double album. Uh, London Calling and you know by this point it, it's quite surprising you, you look it up I can't believe their debut album is a gold album it's pretty bizarre to, to think that but uh, give them enough rope single album second one didn't certify London Calling consider one of the greatest albums of all time um, I think there'll be some people who disagree with that but uh, but you know this this was considered a super super important huge <laughs> album double album it's got uh, a 10, so it's got 18 songs on it. it. It does feel like a true double album. You know, it's nicely broken up to side two, side three and all that. Of course, it's we're going back to 1979 for this, but definitely a, a double album. People loved it to death. They were considered, um, you know, the tagline is The Clash, the only band that matters, right? That's literally was that was the tagline that people said about them. So so what do they do? I was going to talk about this as a follow up to the triple album. But no, I thought it would be more um, interesting to talk about the fact that Clash followed a double album with a triple album. So the next one was Sandinista. And look at that. There's your there's your six sides of new studio material. Literally, uh, so so literally the next year, by the end of the next year, uh, December 1980, they had this triple album out. Now, granted, the one thing people complain about on here is there are four or five kind of dub versions of other songs on it. Maybe not four or five. Uh, and then there's, there's some sound uh, soundtracky stuff. There's a few little throwaways on it, right? Uh, but really, there are solidly five sides of really good clash music on here it sounds very much like the follow-up to london calling but just the audacity you know you and i were talking i think at the end of last episode when we when we turned the tape off it's like can, can we think of anybody else who came up with a triple triple studio album and i i still haven't really thought of one maybe maybe the viewers will tell us a, a triple studio album but uh but no i i thought it was pretty amazing that they could follow up a double album with the triple album, and this was quite well received as well at the time, and it is uh, it is gold. It's certified gold, but who knows? You know, with the with the three records worth of stuff, this was kind of cool too. They had for a lyric sleeve on this, they had the, the sort of cartoony handwritten lyrics. It was a whole whole fold out thing. Where are there? So you got a six panel lyric insert. Oh, that's cool. Uh, with yeah. it, which was kind of cool. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a little more experimental than um, than London Calling, a little bit more down the rabbit hole, but full of tons and tons and tons of amazing, amazing Clash music. So they went single, single, double, triple, 
single single in a notorious last album with Mick Jones gone and that's all that's all they did that was it for the clash so it's a, it's a little bit like that whole Guns N' Roses and Metallica thing where you go oh here's a band that didn't have that many albums but when you add up the amount of music over it it's actually a lot right Metallica only has 10 albums but they're super long right every every one of them pretty much is is a really really long album um so uh so yeah so did they have a hangover it, it seems not it seems they were just in complete creative mode and uh and just just brimming with songs and songwriting and there's there's politics there's all kinds of stuff on here they're exploring all kinds of like reggae music and and like i say a little bit of dub and there's some punk on there there's acoustic stuff there's gospel it's all over the place the only thing that's not on is there's no punk there's no punk on there there's no punk on london calling i mean this this band is long long ago stopped being a punk band so uh there you go sandinista listen to uh I, I never had the original album i only had it on cd uh all things must pass george harrison wasn't that a triple studio good point good point it I might think be it was yeah yeah, yeah. there's not many yeah. though you're right i'm sitting there thinking about it. i'm like uh yeah i think it's the only one huh that i can yeah. think of other than the one you just showed yeah, I don't know, Martin. <laughs> you know, I, I sat here God, like a year ago and I had a conversation with you about London Calling. I had a conversation with Mike Portnoy about London Calling. And I've, I've talked to plenty of people in my life who, you know, proclaim it one of the greatest albums of all time. And I said, I, what am I missing here? I'm going to go and buy it and just find out, right? Yeah. I hate it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love the title track so much and there's nothing else on the album that's like that. I'm like, oh, if only the rest of it was like that. I just, I don't get into the reggae shit and I don't, I just, I don't yeah. know, man. Like it just, nothing on it appealed to me other than that song. I was like, yeah, man, yeah. I tried. Hey, I tried, right? Yeah. No, no, I tried. Good. Good. <laughs> All right. How about, uh, God, I feel like I've been talking about Genesis a lot lately, but hey, Genesis. Lamb Lies Down on Broadway, 1974, double album. Right. Going into uh, Trick of the Tail, two years later, 1976. I right. So we all my vinyl to show too. So. Oh, there you go. Yeah, very cool. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, I think we sometimes forget just how great Trick of the Tail really is because of you know the greatness that came before it but you know just to give for those of you who are not aware uh so the band in 1974 did this album the lamb lies down on broadway this big dark dense concept album with lyrics written by peter gabriel you know about a uh, young puerto rican kid living in new york city named rail uh when the band were putting this album together, Mr. Gabriel was already starting to feel dissatisfied within the band. He was already starting to think that, you know, maybe I need to kind of go do my own thing. Uh, but they do the album, right? Like I said, it's a very different, darker. Most of the stuff that came before is obviously very proggy, a little bit folky, very orchestral, very English, whereas this is just much more serious and, you know, the, 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 the storyline is unlike anything they've ever done. For some people, uh, maybe this album too long shouldn't have been a double album maybe shorter would have been more effective other people love it just the way it is you know you can talk ad nauseum about that but they decide to go take this out on the road and do the entire album you know with all sorts of weird costume changes and things up on the screens and projections and all, all sorts of stuff and it, it was kind of a disaster right so by the end of the tour uh, well, Gabriel I think midway through the tour is basically like guys I'll finish the tour but at the end I'm leaving right so they finish the tour. He's gone. The band's like, all right, we got to find another singer because we're going to continue on. So they do all these auditions for other singers. Nothing's really kind of striking them. Right. And they talking to Phil, of course, their great drummer who, you know, sings a little bit on all the albums before then, you know, backing vocals does a lead vocal or two. And they're like, well, why don't you give some of this? Why don't you give it a try? So Phil decides, all right, I'll give it a shot. And they like what they hear. They make the decision, you know what? We're not going to find another singer. We're going to have Phil be the new singer and play drums on the albums. And out on tour, we'll bring in, you know, another drummer who turns out to be Chester Thompson and we'll make a go of it. And they go into the studio and they put together a trick of the tail, which uh, depending on who you read interviews with or whatever, uh, some of this material was already starting to be worked on uh, while Peter was still in the band, not all of it. And this album comes out in 1976. 
And it's basically like a sequel to Selling England by the Pound. It has a very similar feel. The kind of the darker nature, the epic nature of this is kind of gone, where here you have a selection of songs, all of which, for the most part, have become very beloved by the fan base. They, the band played a lot of this stuff live quite often. Yeah, look at that. That's, that's awesome. Love the artwork on the album. You know, Squonk. Dance on a Volcano, Los Endos, the title track, Trick of the Tales, Ripples was a kind of, you know, surprising hit for the band, Robbery, Assault and Battery, they played live, and even things like Entangled and Mad Man Moon, also very popular with the fans. And again, it's kind of when you listen to these two back to back, it almost does not sound like this, you know, it sounds like the same band, obviously, but thematically and, st and style and sound wise, very, very different. It's almost like the lamb didn't happen. And this is the album that they put out after selling it by the pound, very English sounding, very melodic, very quirky. And the band didn't miss a beat. They go out on tour. And because I think Phil was already such a you know important and beloved member of the band him replacing the iconic peter gabriel was not that much of a hiccup for them so in this case there really was no hangover at all other than the band themselves probably thinking can we do this go out and play in front of all these crowds in front of our fans without without peter up there and with is phil going to be able to do this and as we've seen all these years later they never missed a beat and are and went on to become a much bigger band than they ever were before so there you have it. A, a great album and it's funny just personally speaking like when as the snow is already starting to fall um when I often talk about my favorite uh, Genesis albums, I very rarely mention this one, but I think this one is pretty much just as perfect as some of the ones that are my favorites from the Gabriel era, including The Lamb, Foxtrot, Nursery Crime, Selling England, Trespass. Uh, this is a dynamite, dynamite album. So really for the, for the band, no real hiccup here as far as we all could see. Yeah, and you're right. I mean, it's pretty interesting considering a a... a continuum from selling england it sounds like a punchier bold, bolder more confident version of selling england it even sounds like uh as good as the highlights on on lamb right and lamb gets all the accolades and yet just this is just just start to finish action packed right yeah it's really good it's really good and, and yeah it's got it's got really good production and i oh, yeah. think the band sound really confident and i'm I, what's really surprising to me is how sure of himself Phil sounds on this album. I mean, he like knocks it out of the park on this album. There's, there's like, you know, he was never a full-time singer ever before. And then you listen to this, it's like, wow, you know, and quite frankly, I mean, I love Peter Gabriel to death, but I, I think Phil, especially back then has a, a more complete vocal style than Peter ever did. I think Phil is more of a classic vocalist Whereas Peter had more of the theatrical thing. And, you know, you listen to I mean, he's got a very unique style of singing, but I think Phil is actually a better singer, if that makes any sense at all, from a classic perspective, right? Technical perspective. I don't know. Yeah. But yeah. Great album. Cool. All right. So um, my next choice is the who by numbers. And I, I almost went with who's next because it's a very similar situation. With yeah, it certainly next, is. Following up Tommy. Um, that's almost a happier story, though, because the, who's next is considered, you know, the classic distilled down to, you know, hit after hit, just a just a great album. And it's it's considered, I guess, probably their greatest album. Right. Yeah. Um, but in this situation, it's kind of funny because they're following up also a, a big laborious rock opera in uh, in Quadrophenia. And uh, so 73 over to 75. And I just remember at the time. Um, Critics, everybody sort of started complaining, I think, a little bit about The Who. It's like, are we a little tired of The Who or whatever? I think Squeezebox wasn't that well regarded as a, as a lead single off of this album. It's kind of country, Roger singing. Um, but, uh, but I really like this album. I, I think it's, uh, it's quite good start to finish. Um, you know, Quadrophenia, I, I love the whole mod concept. I did a whole episode of, of uh, History and Five Songs on the mod revival. I, I just love that whole thing. I love the photographs and the bikes and the fashion and all that. I love the jam a lot. I mean, they're, they're one of my favorite bands, period. But just the whole, I, I thought the story was way cooler on this than it was on Tommy. Um, but again, I don't know how particularly well received uh, the who is at this point and I, is the world starting to get a little tired tired of the who? Uh, are the who getting tired of themselves? 
Um, are they starting to fight more? Uh, have they felt like they've done too much uh, rock opera-ness in their life? Um, so it, it was kind of welcome to see them do something like this. But this is a very, this is a very Pete album, although uh, John writes one on here and, and, you know, Roger is singing a lot on it. But man, things like However Much I Booze and, and um, Imagine a Man, uh, they're all in love. All these, all these lighter introspective Pete things on here are really, really cool. But it's got some rocky stuff on it as well. Slip Kid reminds you of a little bit of what you're going to get with Who Are You, um, which is going to be the last one with, um, with Keith. You know, it comes out in Who Are You comes out in August of 78 and Keith dies in September of 78. So that album actually partly because of that unfortunate circumstance uh, becomes a more celebrated album, I think in the who canon. Um, but I remember also at the time, just the critics savaging that record as well. Oh, yeah. um, the who, the who have a really funny, funny um, relationship with the critics. And maybe it's a little bit because Pete is a little bit of a dramatic guy and explainer. Um, you know, John Entwistle is, is considered, a, you you know, he was considered a bit of a, a cranky dude, like a real rock star. Roger was a kind of a, you know, so there's, there's all this, um, th there's so much personality in the who, and I imagine along the way, they've rubbed some people the wrong way in, in the, in the critical world. But I, I just remember, um, I just remember people almost felt like, you know, albums like this felt a little bit like prog albums in the way like something new has to happen maybe punk has to happen the who were considered just a big tired institution um i i feel i you know looking in a little bit from the outside i was only a kid and and uh we were we were metal guys and the who was just this thing over there uh, a little bit it wasn't like i was absorbing these albums in 1975 78 um to the core kind of thing but i but i love it to death now i think it's produced really well glenn johns um you know nippy N nicky hopkins is on it as well um uh, but yeah how many friends big stride and ballad by roger on here just everything there's like just a good mix of songs on it but it but it just felt like everybody was a little tired of the who and it is a true double album hangover that that possibly people have had enough of the who with these massive massive concepts so there you go who by number yeah i mean i i would agree with that i think too i think you know this band expectations were always so high i guess when you come out with you know tommy who's next in quadrophenia one after the other like that that at some point they're going to have to dip right and i think the who really aged they you know because they were this young brash powerful band with this genius songwriter all these four completely different personalities all four rock stars and it's almost like by the time who by numbers came out it's like that, that flame it kind of died out a little bit you know pete was going through all his own issues i think a lot of those songs are very autobiographical he had hit kind of like a wall with his songwriting all of a sudden these big grandiose ideas weren't coming out of his brain anymore and he was kind of struggling he was drinking a lot you know keith had his uh certainly had his demons as well and i think that uh that album for most people you know following up tommy Who's Next and Quadrophenia is no easy feat. I don't think nothing they were going to do is ever going to top any of those three. And I think most people think of Who by Numbers as a disappointment just because expectations were always so high. I think if you take that on its own, even, even Who Are You to an extent, both really solid albums, I think, with a lot of really good material. Are they the three that came before it? No. Yeah. But cool. what, what could compete with those, right? Yeah. And all of a sudden, like the Who weren't this cool, young, brash band. It's almost like the Who became like the old dinosaurs. And they were like, what, in their late 20s? I mean, that's what the 70s did to a lot of these bands. Yeah. yeah. All right. Tales from Topographic Oceans by Yes is the big double album followed by Relayer. Yeah. Um, yeah. So 1973. Buying a lot of that, too. Yeah. Such so great. I mean, arguably the two greatest Roger Dean covers. Just absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. So the band here on Topographic Oceans decides to take close to the edge their previous album to the next level. Uh, a double album with only four songs. E gads, Batman, right? Uh, so Bill Bruford's gone from the band. He's gone off to join King Crimson to do even wackier and crazier, more complex music. In comes Alan White. Could you imagine this be, you'd be the new drummer in the band. This is the first album you work on. 
So basically, this is a idea concept album created by John Anderson and Steve Howe, uh, compositions based on old Hindu text. It's all very indecipherable and complicated and uh, dense and aloof at the same time. And it's one of those albums I think people either really loved or they hated. Um, it goes gold in the U.S., so it does pretty well. But like you've mentioned quite a bit, um, when you have double albums, the sales kind of count twice. So when you really think about it, this probably was nowhere near the seller that close to the edge or fragile uh, was. And, uh, you know, the band went out and played this on tour, the entire album. Rick Wakeman hated it. OK, absolutely hated performing. It didn't like recording it. He decides at the end of the tour that he's leaving. Right. So he leaves. They decide to bring in a guy named Patrick Moraz, who played with uh, Refugee and Main Horse. Very good keyboard players, a Swiss guy. And they uh, go back into the studio and they do this album called Relayer, which, again, kind of along the same epic lines that this was and close to the edge. So here we have another single album, but with only three tracks, you've got the monstrous uh, gates of delirium on side one of the vinyl. Excellent song uh, matches up with some of the best epics they've ever done. You have sound chaser and to be over on side two sound chaser decidedly kind of jazz fusion-y. I mean, the band were had mentioned that they were listening to Return to Forever and the Mahavishnu Orchestra at the time, not surprisingly. And they've got a keyboard player in Mraz who is very good at playing, you know, more jazz style things. So this album does really well. This also does gold. They go out and they play this live. All right. He seems to be, Mr. Mraz seems to be working out fine within the band, but I guess personalities didn't really mesh. I think there was some grumbling about he wanted a bigger stake in the band and not just as a sideman whatever the guys in the band decide to go all out after this tour is over they do solo albums and what have you and before you know it you blink and mr wakeman is back in the band and going for the one is uh is being put together and released and uh so yeah i mean i think looking back most yes fans i talk to universally love this album there are some that worship this album and there's some that just absolutely hate this album. And I think this musically speaking has lots of great things on there, but this is not an easy listen for me. I have to be in the mood to say, all right, I'm going to dedicate an hour and a half of my time and I'm going to listen to Tales from Topographic Ocean start to finish. There is no kind of like, I'll just play Gates of Delirium. I'll just play Sound Chase or whatever. This, you got to, this, this is, you have to take it all in or you don't listen to it at all. And I think over the years, you know, Yes has dipped back into this album on tour. They played Ritual and uh, The Ancient from time to time. But I, it's interesting how they never went back to do something of this scope ever again. And this is a band that, you know, does this. They kind of do things like this, but they never went back to do the big, massive double album like this ever again. And they just kind of kept things a little more, uh, you know, even keel going forward. So I think, you know, as far as the hangover goes, they did it. They tried it. They experimented. But, you know, let's get back to basics on the next album, which, you know, again, is classic. Yes. Right. So there you have it. That's pretty, pretty amazing. I mean, in, in, in certain ways, Relayer is almost more frantic and more raw and more crazy than than Tales. I mean, if you would have taken the, the the nutty lyrics off of Tales and put just regular, you know, encapsulated down non conceptual lyrics, uh, you know, that's actually even like musically probably the more the more commercial album. Uh, and here you've got you've got a twenty one minute song and two nine minute songs. It's like I, I it's a the audacity of following up Tales with that is, is yeah. pretty crazy. And then, it, and then again, you know, the songs get shorter and going for the one and Tormato and, and forward on, but. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. it's a really good point, but it's, yeah. it's just interesting how to many people relayer is more acceptable, right? It's the same way as like close to the edge is very, is deemed one yeah. of the greatest programs of all time, even though you have three like ridiculously long compositions on it, you know, maybe four long songs, 20 minutes each is just a little too much for some people. I don't know. I, I just find for me, um, and you're absolutely right, there are there are passages on Relayer that are just as complicated as anything on Tales. But then you got the little soon section at the end of Gates of Delirium to be over is pretty nice and melodic. So, yep. But yep. Sound Chaser is just like, holy cow, that's just nonstop, you know, wackiness, right? And I love it for it. But yeah, it, it's... Yeah. It's interesting when you really break it down, they're really not all that different, but in our minds, our perceptions are that yeah. topographic oceans, big and overblown and relayer, just what we want from them. 
you know, and you know, yeah. Yeah, you have to wonder. I, I, I think the, for me, the most interesting thing is is Wakeman's take on topographic oceans because you would think. I mean, look at some of the solo stuff that Wakeman has done. That's out there too. So the fact that he just despised topographic oceans is that because he didn't have a hand in a lot of the writing? I don't know, but he absolutely hated. It. Or maybe the fact that they went and played the whole thing live in concert. Maybe that was just too much. I don't know. But I always thought his perception was always the most interesting thing about the whole topographic oceans is his distaste for it from completely right yeah. there's got to be a reason for that so i don't know Depends on the nice thought. thing about relayer too is to be over has an internal logic to it like you say it's it's just a, a good accessible song sound chaser has its own internal logic as the swirling white knuckle song and then gates is a is a sober sensible well put together close to the edge part too so yeah yeah there's, there's no real problem with it, right? Yeah, no, it, that's what we want from Yes, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, my next choice is Pink Floyd, The Final Cut. I've got my old Pink Floyd book here that's out of uh, out of print, but uh, but I it, I took this out because I wanted to read again. There's your, there's the final cut chapter. There's your cover, but uh, but it's really nice. I mean, uh, for this one, I interviewed a buddy of mine, Ralph Chapman. Oh, well, two buddies of mine, and Robert Korich. Um, and uh, and they had a lot of good things to say about the final cut that that really actually made making this book a, a real highlight because it, it gave me a new appreciation of this album that notoriously Pete doesn't have a high opinion of it, and neither do I really. Um, but but it 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 gave me it gave me more uh like look at this record more seriously but the interesting thing of course with the final cut is that you're going from the wall which is the double album in 79 and it's like four years later uh you're you're coming up to the final cut rick wright gets fired in between and this is really really a roger waters album all the dirty laundry is out there everybody knows they're kind of fighting this is this is roger you know to the fore even more um you know, they're, they're more or less a band on Dark Side and more or less a band on Wish You Were Here. And then Roger really starts to take over on Animals. And, and you know, the wall is, is really all his concept that he's fighting tooth and nail to make this massive double album, which goes 23 times platinum. Final cut, we're down double platinum. Um, and, and in terms of the music on here, you know, it's, it's, you're hearing all the same Pink Floyd tricks all over again with lots of sound effects. So are, at this point, are you getting a little tired of it? Because there was a lot on, on the wall. Um, and they'd been doing that for quite a while anyways. Uh, but musically, what you get on here is, uh, is a lot of quiet, contemplative, keyboardy and ruminating. And then, and then if there's any volume whatsoever, you know, it's, it's the slowest tempos possible. That, that you can make. I mean, Pink Floyd specializes in these slow tempos, but this is slow tempos all the way, all the way throughout, you know, all the way up until um, not now, John essentially is, is the, is the up-tempo moment. Right. Um, but other than that, it, this is just quiet, loud, quiet, loud, as we talked about on the, on that excellent, excellent. Um, I, I loved being part of that, the Roger Waters in, in the prog seat episode and this, and this really, as, as we talked about there, um, this really reminds me of uh, of uh, the pros and cons of hitchhiking and amused to death uh, very much. It, it sounds like these three albums go together. Um, so this is this is Roger going from essentially a solo album, and and um, you know this was very badly received at the time, of course, as well. Um, and it caused and after this, Roger is out of the band, and Pink Floyd just really. Almost like uh, you know, they're massive, massive albums, but 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 the albums without Roger are not critically all that uh, that beloved either. So uh, so the Wall is is considered one of the great masterpieces of all time, and then not the final cut, and not momentary lapse, uh, and not Division Bell, yeah. right? <clears throat> yep. Certainly not Endless River. Um, but uh, but yeah, it's uh, th this was this was almost like framed as way too much Roger uh, in, in our lives on, on this album, because it is him going back uh, again with a lot of, a lot of political stuff and a lot of referencing, you know, the unfortunate uh, death of his father in world war two. Um, not a great album cover, not a hypnosis album cover. Roger famously fires hypnosis. Gerald scarf does the wall and, uh, and this is not hypnosis either. So it, it just, uh, you know, David Gilmore was not on board with most of what's going on. Uh, on the record and it was just considered uh definitely a uh definitely well both a, a critical and uh, and commercial uh you know big disappointment um although 
still it's it's a very very ambitious record uh it's just it's just almost like too much of one guy i suppose yeah i mean and that's that's always been my main issue with i think a lot of people think i just like to pick on final cuts just because i like to i i, I want to love the final cut and I just find it's a very morose, depressing album to listen to. I just, I don't get any enjoyment out of listening to it at all. I know Roger's pouring his heart and soul into this, into the lyrics, into the vocals and everything like that, but it just doesn't sound like a Pink Floyd record to me. And I think that's, that's also part of the issue that I've always had with the wall. The wall has moments of brilliance, but like the whole thing there, there, there's way too much on the wall that I don't really care for much, but there, are, and I think that's what the final cut was missing. There are, there are certain moments and songs on the wall that are just uh classic floyd that are just enjoyable and fun to listen to and challenging musically and great gilmore guitars and it's not any of that to me on the final cut uh, I, I would give the final cut a pass i think if there were at least three four songs that i thought like really cut the mustard and gave you what you want i don't get any of that from the final cut yeah maybe it's just, maybe it's just me because i know a lot of people who think that's one of the most brilliant releases ever Hey, that's cool. I, I just personally, I don't hear it. So, but I think you're right. It's to me, it's too much Roger, way too much. And not, it's not happy Roger, as we know, <laughs> Roger's not always happy on a lot of these albums, right? But he's really not happy on this one. It's just like, and it's, it's not, it doesn't make for a happy listening experience for me. So. Yep. Well put. All right. All right. Let's move over to dream theater. <laughs> I'm sure folks knew this was coming. Um, 2016, the band releases the astonishing, a uh, two disc, two act concept album written by John Petrucci uh, about a it's like a sci fi fantasy story based on a futuristic dystopian society uh, where like kind of music controls everything that's going on, whatever. It's this big convoluted concept um, that I just never really got. I mean, I have no problems with concept albums, fantasy, sci fi based. I mean, we've talked about so many of them in the past. But uh, my main issue with this album, and I think a lot of people, again, this one falls into another you love it or you hate it album, kind of like the, uh, the Nostradamus thing. Uh, and Dream Theater have done concept albums before. This is not the first time they've done them, but this is the first time I think it's just, it's based on a, a specific storyline. And, you know, there's kind of like, I think what any prog or metal bands decide to do like a fantasy or sci-fi based story, there's the, 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 the term cheese comes up, right? The cheese factor. Uh, and I think that this doesn't work and, and didn't work for a lot of people, though I'm sure it has its fans, because a lot of the elements that we've grown to expect and love from Dream Theater are kind of missing here. There's not really a lot of catchy melodies and catchy songs, the hooks. There's even not a ton of the big, you know, amazing virtue, you know, musical virtuosity that you get on all these albums. I mean, a lot of Dream Theater fans, very picky. They want to hear all this real complex stuff that makes a lot of sense. And uh, not a lot of it here. It's just a lot of short songs that aren't really that interesting. I remember when this first came out, I wanted to love it because the album cover is great. And I love concept albums. Bored the crap out of me. Went to go see them live. I knew they were going to play the whole thing. I said, maybe live, it'll really click with me. I, I found it even more boring live on stage than I found on the album. James Labrie, none, none of the guys in the band talked to the audience in between the tracks. They just basically played the whole thing. They didn't say a word to the audience, which I thought was bizarre. And, you know, for me and for a lot of people, this was just big, overblown, doesn't really work. Kind of deviates a bit, kind of like the Nostradamus thing, deviates a lot from when the band do really well. So fast forward to uh, 2019. So three years later, they come back with their first like kind of regular album, Distance Over Time. And this, I believe by this point, this is what the fourth album, I believe, with Mike Mangini on drums who replaced Mike Portnoy. So this is back to basics. It clocks in just under an hour. All right, nine tracks, no comp, no, no concept. Tracks aren't relating at all. And back once again are the catchy hooks, the jaw-dropping musicality. I mean, the untethered angel, paralyzed, pale blue dot, uh, S2N, one of my favorites on the album. It's got the big heavy riffs. Uh, Labrie is sounding good. There's no trying to portray different characters of a storyline. And then you go, I went to see them live on this tour and they played a good chunk of it live at different points during the set. And all the songs just really just fit in with the regular, you know, dream theater classics. And uh, this was very well received by the fans. 
also you got all the guys in the band once again contributing uh lyrics and songs and, and music and things like that so it, it again sounded more like a band album whereas this i think was a john petrucci experiment that didn't quite work uh this back to basic dream theater and i think everybody's like all right the dream theater i know and love is is back and uh so yeah so i think there definitely was a hangover after this i, I was reading an interview uh just yesterday with petrucci from you know a couple of years ago and he was like you know we really wanted to do something like this i think some people were on board with it but for a lot of fans it kind of went right over our heads so we wanted to kind of get back to doing you know what we normally do so and it worked i think yeah it's funny with that band it's almost like um Doing something conceptual is almost too expected, given that they are a prog band and a prog metal band and the productions are amazing. And James is a really thespian lead vocalist and stuff. So it's so it's almost like uh, like a, a double album is uh, is expected and, and not particularly wanted out of them. Right. There's just so much to absorb anyways. Right. On, on a yeah. I album. mean, they've, they've done their share of double albums, but usually it's double albums where you've got some themes running through a few yeah. tracks or you got a, a 20 minute long track, a 15 minute long track, and then a couple other shorter ones. Uh, but not like one continuous, you know, 80 minutes worth of music yeah. with the same storyline. And whereas it I think to, to me and a lot of people, it was we got to do the storyline we got to do it exact and all the little things that usually make dream theater albums so enjoyable are not there i mean there's there's none of the, the catchy hooks there's none of those extended instrumental passages and you know the sick guitar solos and keyboard solos and all that kind of stuff you know it, it's in spots but and and you have all these little three minute long four minute long tracks and none of them are memorable none i mean you if you were to ask me right now what's my favorite track on this album i couldn't even tell you I couldn't even tell you. I'm looking at the track. I'm like, uh, I have no idea because none of them really stand out. It's just, you listen, this is one, again, like Nostradamus, you listen to the whole thing and you're like, all right, I can't even pick out any highlights because this one song kind of bleeds into the next. There's these little interludes in between. I'm like, eh. So I don't know. It's just, to me, it was an epic failure and I'm a huge fan and I, I've loved everything they've done. I have no desire to ever listen to that again. That's yeah. you know, all right. You know, they got another system. That's, and I think that's what some of these bands do with these double albums, the ones that don't do them often, right? But. Yeah. Okay, my last choice for today is uh, Rolling Stones with Goat's Head Soup. Um, I, I picked this because it, it really reminds me of the Who story, um, except, you know, Exile on Main Street is not, a, um, is not a concept album. So Exile comes out May of 72. This is uh, August of 73. So they're back relatively quickly with this. Um, but why, why it reminds me of The Who is that people just love the previous run of albums and with The Stones, it's like a, like a beautiful run that ends in a double album that's kind of like considered loosely their Americana album, but it's also, it's, it's got a lot of hits on it. It's pretty rock and rollsy. It's well recorded. Um, you know, famously, there's a lot of drugs and stuff in the band, but, but it almost feels like, um, you know, other, you know, different than the who in that it's not conceptual, but it almost feels like, uh, like, like a double who's next. It's, it's that good. People love it a lot. Um, and also it's, it's this run of albums where you've got like the, the, the let it bleeds and the beggars banquets and even satanic majesty's request and, and all these, you know, good albums leading up to it. Um, but again, at the same time, it feels like, um, have people had enough of the stones? They, they, you know, they had a lot of goodwill after exile exile, but this album was not that well received. And, uh, I think of the three that I consider a little bit of a trilogy in this point. Um, so you get this, you get, it's only rock and roll and you get black and blue. Um, I'm, I think a little bit in the minority that I love black and blue a lot. Um, I think a lot of people didn't like that one a lot. I think it's only rock and roll is a fantastic stones album. Um, but this one gets a lot of abuse. Um, Dancing with Mr. D, uh, you know, was, was, a, was, was played a little bit uh, on the radio. Obviously Angie is sort of the big song on here. Heartbreaker is kind of a hard Rocky one. That's big, but they've kind of, they've done this trick before. It's, it's not that much of an improvement over anything. Um, Angie, Angie feels like an older song, like a, like a wild oh, yeah. horses or something like that. Uh, but silver trains a really good one on here. Up temp, up tempo kind of honky tonk rocker. There's a lot of, a lot of piano on this album. You've got, um, 
You've got Nikki Hopkins, Ian Stewart, and Billy Preston, I think, on here. Um, yeah, uh, three different piano players on it. Uh, but the whole the whole second side has got some really kind of like uh, even even under ambitious songs for the Stones, which we all love them to death, and they're so charming because they just seem to be such slackers. The the kind of music they make is just so. It's, it's just so raw and simple and they're daring you a little bit like an ACDC uh, to, to love the simplicity of what they're doing. Uh, but, but side two with, with winter, hide your love, kind of like a blues, which is mostly piano on there. Can you hear the music is like funky, slow, awkward sort of feeling thing. Um, star, star, old, old time rock and roll kind of feel of that. So, so it really loses steam on a, uh, on side, on side two. Um, Hundred years ago, coming down again. Um, beautiful, beautiful, kind of like softer stones. But basically, this record, um, I think, is by far. I'm, I was never, never big into this cover art either. Yeah, There's obviously the, the wild goats, <laughs> goats head in the in the cauldron thing that is really cool. Um, but uh, but no, I definitely by far, by far, this is my least favorite of the trilogy of of those three that come next before they have. Have their reascendance. So, so there's this, there's this, this weird feeling in the middle, just like the Who, in the middle of the '70s, where has the world had enough of the Rolling Stones for a bit? And are they kind of like, ah, here's here's our single album after this great double album. It's not great. Here's another single album with a weird album cover that kind of creep people out, and it's only rock and roll. Um, and then Black and Blue, like I say, it it just I, I don't think it it was that all that well received critically or commercially. And then boom, they're back again. Um, everybody loves the Stones. Some girls comes out, and the Stones are like the it band all of a sudden again, uh, which is really the first time they felt like uh, you know. And and even when Exile came out, it wasn't that they were the it band. It, it was at that point they were still like just kind of like the kings at the top of the pile but they're still like like the the old already the old grandfathers of rock and roll with with exile but but some girls it's like a new excitement about the stones it's like stones for a new generation and they're and they're doing great and then you know emotional rescue not not so much again but um but you get to uh tattoo tattoo you right yeah, yeah. tattoo you yeah uh huge again uh, almost like they're an it band twice in 78 and then whatever that is 80 or 81 uh again so so people are loving the stones by that point again but this really is uh really the low point of the entire career really um i think until you know arguable 80s points um and really no no real points in the in the 60s except for you know Satanic Majesty's got some shtick for being like, you know, a repeat of Sergeant Pepper or whatever, uh, that that kind of thing. Hey, we can be a psych band or whatever. But for the 70s, I think it never got any lower than uh, than Goat's Head Soup. So I think you definitely have a double album hangover with the Stones. Personally, I love Goat's Head Soup. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I think side one is absolutely terrific. And yep. side two, while very different, I think, had, I mean, winter is just to me. I love winter. And uh, right. Star Star, I think, is a lot of fun. And I, I don't know. I just I think it's a really good album. I think it's completely underrated, but I can totally see why people were not that into it. And I also love It's Only Rock and Roll. I think they're both really underrated Stones albums, but kind of like the Who situation, right? How do you follow up, uh, you know, Sticky Fingers and Exile? I mean, just how do you do that? Yeah. Anything they released was, was not going to be as good. And, I think uh, production wise, it's only rock and roll and certainly black and blue are, are crisper and more confident sounding. They, they, this is kind of gauzy and, and a little bit muffled sounding. Yeah. And, and I think even the craftsmanship on it's only rock and roll, it's a little, little more uh, up tempo. It, it just feels more professional to me than, than goat's head soup. And, but, but yeah, I, all, all three of those, it was a little bit, again, just like the who is a little bit like, punk comes in and you know the the narrative is all oh, punk is oh they're all upset about prog and elp and all that kind of things you know detached superstars but but you know at the same time i think there were there was um there was just as much of a backlash against deep purple led zeppelin the who and the rolling stones yeah yeah they're all they're all of a sudden the dinosaurs now right yeah but yeah i agree that album cover didn't help That's, no yeah <laughs> not good yeah, yeah. <laughs> not sure what they were thinking of that right i don't know 
All right. My last choice for today, uh, a guy who is uh, going into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, Mr. Todd Rundgren. 1972 Something Anything is the uh, double album. And the follow up is A Wizard, A True Star a year later. So the audacity of a young guy named Todd Rundgren, who only had uh, two albums to his credit, releasing a double so, or such, so early in his career. Uh, pretty kind of bold move, I think, but really interesting album in that each side represented sort of a different theme and a uh, different style. He tried to like, you know, he had his rocks, rock side, the pop side, the soul side, you know, the whole thing and plays most of the entrance on the album, you know, gets some guests for side four, which is again, the big kind of like Motowny type of thing. Um, but it goes gold, spawns a couple hit singles, not a massive success, though. It's funny. Looking back on it, I always was under the impression that this was a much bigger seller than it actually was. It only went gold, but yet it had massive hits on it, like Hello, It's Me, I Saw the Light, Couldn't I Just Tell You? I mean, these were big radio songs, especially Hello, It's Me. So I think I, we always assumed that this was a bigger album than it was. But, you know, most folks look back on the career of Todd Rundgren, and this is his masterpiece. So the double album is looked at as the masterpiece. So here we have the hangover of How Do You Follow Up? your first big successful album and what does he do he goes out and starts experimenting with uh, lsd and psychedelic drugs and he decides that ah, i don't know if i want to do a straightforward pop album again i think i want to do something a little more experimental and he goes and, and puts together a wizard a true star which is back to a single album although a pretty lengthy single album i think this is close to i think at the time this was the longest single album in rock and roll history at the time so it's, it's pushing an hour um, but here he's experimenting with different things. Uh, all of a sudden he's uh, listening to jazz. He's listening to psychedelia. All of a sudden this new thing called prog rock, he's doing drugs. And he felt very strongly about, I don't want any singles coming out from this album. I want people to buy this album and listen to it from start to finish. Okay which kind of an interesting take considering the album he did before and considering how much singles were being pushed back in the day to sell records. Okay. He, he wanted it to be uh, accepted and enjoyed as a whole, not picking apart songs as such. It barely dented the top 100. I think it, it, it peaked at like 86 or something like that album sales considered a failure at the time, even though critics really liked it quite a bit. Um, but all the pop fans he gained with this, they stayed away from this in droves. A, maybe because they bought it, they didn't like it. But B, radio wasn't playing any of it because they did not want to release any singles. The interesting thing is there are more than a few songs on this album that could have been huge singles. I mean, Sometimes I Don't Know How to Feel is a great pop song. International Feel is awesome. Uh, what else we got? Is It My Name? Good rock song. Just One Victory is one of his great rock anthems. Does anybody love you? Zen Archer, gorgeous song. You got the Motown medley on the back, which is so much fun. So in between a lot of the weird stuff on here, this is almost like a weird kind of like Frank Zappa, you know, out type of an album in that it's like so eclectic through and through. But he's got a few guys who would be part of his Utopia band on this album. Utopia would launch shortly there after this. Um, but I just think that this is his, now all these years later, many people are hailing this as, this is his masterpiece as opposed to this. But yet back in the day, this was looked at as a failure. And, you know, again, Todd wanted to do something different. I don't want to do a, a double pop album, double album, pop album. I want to go off into uncharted territory and the general public just didn't get it. But I think that uh, he and the record label really screwed up because there definitely are at least two, maybe three could have been hit singles on this album, which I think would have helped it sell and, you know, would have helped the masses realize the genius of this guy that he followed up, you know, this very accessible album with a kind of a weird album, but still with some really good, good tracks on it as well. So I don't know, definitely a hangover more so coming from him. It's almost like he did this so early on. It's like, yeah, I'm not doing that again. But in, in the, at the same token, he wanted to kind of really branch out a little bit more with this one. So I think, uh, again, I, I believe Wizard is his true masterpiece all these years later. Uh, it's just a shame that like the, the general public never kind of saw that. 
Plus you make, you make a double like that with just your name on it and that, and, and it, it just builds the legend. Right. And, and that's, you know, and then he goes on, he's almost, he, he's almost known for some, some of the records he produced more. Uh, just as much or more. more. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. It's like, th this is, this is your resume for a producer. You're, you have the audacity to make a double album. Yeah. It's funny because when they first announced that he was up for a nomination for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, you know, a couple of years ago, uh, I, I'd gotten to many conversations with people because to me, he, not just on his music, but his musical ability and his production skills and, you know, look at all the great albums he produced. There were a lot of people like, oh, what did Todd Rundgren ever do? Why would he, why should he be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? Did he ever have a million selling album? Did he ever have a number one single and all that kind of stuff? And no, he never had a million seller album. I think gold is, his, is his, I think something, anything was his biggest selling record, either him or Utopia. Um, but he had plenty of hit singles, you know, maybe not a number one smash, but look at all those best-selling albums he produced, right? So it's yeah. more of like a very well-rounded career. But I, I often think that he, if you ever like would ask him, he would probably say, yeah, it would have been a nice to be a, a million-selling artist, but that was never what he was all about. I think, I think if he, when he looks back on his career, he's probably pretty satisfied with the way things turned out. Because I, I don't think he was ever a, I want to be in the spotlight type of guy. Um, and, and I think just his decision on this album to to convince the label not to release anything as a single, it's almost like he's like the anti rock star. Right? It's like, you know, and I mean, that's pretty old school. It's like I want you to hear this album start to finish the way it's meant to be. Don't pick things out of it uh, just to, to help boost the sales. I'm not all about that. You know, maybe not a good decision looking back, but that's the way you want. It. Yeah. And he's, he's, I, I love how he's almost an underground artist at times. And I love the way he put out so much stuff, right? That, that proves that creativity is king for him. Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah, he's yeah. on this, you know, kind of little label and uh, yeah, just releasing an album a year, every other year. And, you know, I got a, I got a good chunk of them and man, none of them are alike. I mean, everyone is completely yeah. different than the one that came before. And uh just, yeah. uh, you know, as much as they call a guy like uh, David Bowie, the, the the rock and roll chameleon, right? I think Todd Rundgren, in a, in a weird way, kind of was as well. I mean, he never stayed in any kind of style for too long. And, you know, if you ask anybody, I'm just like, Todd Rundgren, you know what kind of music he played? Uh, I don't know. He had that one, Hello, It's Me. He played in that prog band Utopia. He did New Wave. It's like he did Soul. It's like a little bit of everything. You can't pigeonhole him at all. Yeah, for so, sure. Yeah. Pretty cool. All right. Honorable mention time. Yeah, I got a few here. Um, I got a short list. I Well, Led Zeppelin, obviously, Physical Graffiti into Presence. I think there's a, a definitely a hang over there, considering I consider Physical Graffiti the greatest record ever made by anybody. Um, Fleetwood Mac, Mirage, The Cure had, a, you know, the, the double Kiss, Kiss, Kiss Me. Um, Beatles, you could say, double album. Uh, you know, you got the White Album in there and Yellow Submarine, Abbey Road, whichever. Um, Spock's Beard, I think. Uh, Smash, Smashing Pumpkins had Melancholy and the Infinite Sadness, which was a massive, massive, huge album. And how do you follow that up? That's like their masterpiece, right? Um, Bruce Springsteen, Nebraska, uh, After the River, right? um yeah. you know the river's kind of typical and loud and boisterous and nebraska's quiet and uh and i almost considered uh, i almost made another audible and switched to xtc because we just did a a contrarians pa uh, pa uh, patreon panel on xtc none such which is a follow-up to a double album uh oranges and lemons and yeah. even earlier they had a, a follow-up which would be mummer to uh to english settlement which was a double album kind of a short double album so it's it's a little bit of that going on as well but yeah xdc could have been talked about in in a, a couple of instances here so that's what that's what i had yeah i do want to mention the spock's beard thing again because i think the spock's beard situation is almost identical to the genesis one so here you had this you know fairly popular in the underground prog band who has this kind of iconic front man in neil morse sings plays keyboards writes a lot of the music and is kind of like you know you think it's fox beard neil morse right and he decided you know they released that album snow which is their big double concept album very kind of similar in tone to the lamb and you know leading into that album he's already thinking you know he becomes a born again christian and he's already thinking that i probably need to explore my musical interests now outside of this band based on my newfound spirituality. So they release Snow, it's a 
acclaimed and everything. It's very different from the albums they put out before. And then he leaves and they just, you know, they're trying to figure out what do we do, man? Our, 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 the big draw on the band leaves. What are we going to do? They start, you know, trying to experiment with other singers. And then lo and behold, Nick DiVirgilio, the, the drummer, who, again, also would do background vocals and things on the previous albums, just like Phil, decides that, that, you know, they decide that he's going to be the new singer in the band. So and then they, you know, he becomes the singer for the next bunch of albums. They release Feel Euphoria, which comes after it and different in tone than the album, than the Snow album. But again, kind of going back to what Spock's Beard always used to do. And that's, you know, very catchy, you know, up-tempo well-written prog stuff right and uh so a very very similar story and so i, I did just kind of want to throw that out there and then uh my other one too is uh, chicago five so chicago very very known for releasing double i mean what what other band would release as their debut album a double album their second album is a double album their third album is a double album then they re release a triple live album and then they put out chicago five as a single album and no hangover there because it basically has all the elements of the earlier albums, just a little bit more compact and uh, including a couple hit singles. And, uh, you know, I, I can imagine the band probably were like, all right, enough, enough of that double album stuff. Cause they never, they never did another one again. Well, no, I'm sorry. Chicago seven was a double album as well. So they, they didn't quite have it out of their system just yet. But. <laughs> cool. cool. <laughs> nice. Could you imagine no other band in history would ever have the balls to do that? That is crazy. Yeah. And, and they were like big sellers. I mean, that's the crazy yeah. thing, right? But. Huh. Wow. Cool. <laughs> so there you have it, everybody. Uh, the double album hangover. If there are any others that we didn't talk about that uh, you are thinking of, please put them in the comments below. And uh, Martin and I will be uh, checking those out and seeing what kind of maybe obvious ones that we that we kind of missed on here today. Uh, Martin, uh, updates on your end from uh, Contrarians, the podcast, books, and all that sort of yeah, stuff? Yeah, yeah. Podcast, so the last one was uh, Early Mutt Lang. Haven't done the next one yet. Um, Contrarians, we just had, uh, what did we have go up? Uh, oh, the Def Leppard one on Hysteria that I did with Tim Derling, that just went up. And I think the panel on Point of Entry is going to be up soon. And then um, I just got three boxes of books from the UK in. Um, so I've got one more box. I got eight more copies of the Thin Lizzy, which I haven't had for ages, the Thin Lizzy visual biography. A few things got a little damaged in there. So anybody wants a deal on the Smoke and Valves book, the old new wave of British heavy metal or, or the Deep Purple Royal Family timeline books, a couple of those got a little bit dinged. Uh, the Alice Cooper's got a little dinged as well. So I've got some out three or two left of the Alice Cooper. But um, yeah, so a little grab bag of stuff. Sabotage came in. Those are all in great shape. And the second of the Thin Lizzy regular story, The Sun Goes Down, those, those were all in perfect shape too. And it always happens. No matter, they, they do beautiful job packing all this stuff, but boxes get rolled around and stuff. It's so easy to just bump the corners and stuff. So usually I get a lot of, uh, of bumped corners in the UK stuff. So any, anybody wants any deals on any of this stuff, just let me know. But uh, yeah, martinpopup.com for all that. Cool. Sounds good. Everybody head on over to Martin's website and check all that stuff out. And uh, also visit us on the web at www.seatranquility.org. Visit us on Facebook, check us out on Twitter. But of course, thanks for joining us here on YouTube all the damn time. We'll see you all next Friday with another uh, episode of uh, Friday Morning at the Fun House for Martin Popoff, IMP Pardo. Stay tuned. Tomorrow, we've got uh, the UK Connection with Simon Bray and Stephen Reed, a very fun discussion all about... Uh, Swedish power metal veteran Sabaton that's coming up on Saturday tomorrow and then uh, Martin and I will actually be back together on Sunday for our rematch of album homework assignment so stay tuned for that Sunday morning at 10 p.m eastern uh, 10 p.m 10 a.m eastern standard time so uh, we'll see you all then and then uh, back on Monday with the Hudson Valley Square so for Martin Popoff I'm Pete Pardo have a good one everybody see you soon bye-bye